want you to hear me clearly this morning. A lot of what's going on now in this particular season, the church has been having to redefine its definitions of certain things. I want you to take this into consideration. A lot of things that we've taught, I'm talking about collectively in the body of Christ, seemed like they were valid at that particular time and place and season because there was nothing to offset that. Now, I want you to hear me. It's very, we have to be very careful about saying a lot of half-truths because until they're being, they're being tested, we don't know if, if, if this is the way it is all the time. And I'm going to go somewhere with the statement I just made. A lot of times in the body of Christ, we say things that are absolutely the way they are. But we have to make sure that they are substantiated by multitudes of different scriptures. We believe that the word of God is relevant in every situation in life, even in times of crisis. But we have to get a proper understanding. Now, anything that we say in these videos, or what, whether we preach in the pulpit, I mean... You have a right to examine those things to make sure that they're of God or not. That's, that, that's, that's fine. But the truth of the matter is, is that because we all, we all want to come to an understanding of what truth is. Because we don't want to be right at the expense of, I mean, I'm going to say it like this. We, we want to make sure that we're right in the sight of God. More so than anything else like that. We don't want to labor and try to prove that we're right concerning the em emphasizing a point at the expense of, uh, of walking in any type of deception. That's not what it's about. Apostle Young is not into that. I realize that I have to stand before the Lord behind what we teach and preach. So, eternity is a long time. And I don't want to be saying stuff <laughs> and then getting myself in trouble with God Trying to manipulate scriptures. That's not what it's about. So, what we want to do is we want to take the time to talk about some things that seem like at this particular time are easier to talk about. Because, mind you, the stuff that I'm getting ready to talk about right now, some of it. I'm like, listen, there may be other things during the season that I may talk about. But what I'm talking about right now is something that, that I believed even before this season that we're in right now, where a lot of the churches have been kind of, um, I mean, put in, put in a holding pattern. Now, it doesn't matter how long this season lasts right here as far as the ability to fellowship. We know that in time, in the future, we're going to have to deal with, with, with situations again because the Bible tells us that we're going to be dealing with, with different things that's happening. So, again, right now, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. And it's time to re-examine ourselves because this is the thing. The scripture in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 where it talks about the forsaking of ourselves together. That now, we've had to redefine what that means because the church is not supposed to stop because of a few ordinances in regards to social distancing, social spacing and stuff like that. We understand that we still have to minister the gospel even in times like these. And then the idea of whether we should obey the laws of the land is now coming. We, we have to redefine what that actually means. So we say a lot of things before what we say is being tested because now people said that, that, it would, that you know, going to the local church if you was not in the local church, you was pretty much in deception. But that's being tested now. <laughs> really. The work of the Lord still has got to continue, irregardless of what's happening. And we got to redefine what forsaking of ourselves together actually really means. We, we have to redefine all of those things during this season. Because until, us, until stuff is tested... We can say stuff with, with all the confidence and the assurance that we're right. So, so, how, so how do we handle situations like that he, here and now? Because we understand there is no distance in the anointing. And I understand from personal experience. 
that when people are making transitions from place to place, sometimes they are out there and not necessarily connected to a specific place. Ultimately, you want to be connected, but how do, how do we classify being connected? We need to understand it. How do we classify what truly being connected is in this particular season and time? You know what I mean? Because the, the work of the Lord, because we still have to administer the word of the Lord to the people. We still have to prophesy. We still have to bless people. We still have to teach the word of God, even if it's through social media. We still got to be able to do those things. We can still connect through social media and still be connected. Does everybody understand that? It's important to know that. Hallelujah. Because again, I'm going to tie this together to what we're talking about right now. God is not limited. I said all that to say this. God is not limited as to how he reaches you. God is not limited as to how he blesses you. God is not limited in how he feeds you. In an ideal situation, it is better for us to all be together in, in, in one particular place, in an ideal situation. But what happens if something like this happens in the, in the near future? Are, are we going to shut down the portals of heaven because of a few ordinances that tells us that we can that we that we can barely spend time I mean intimate time with the saints are, are, are we supposed to be able to stop ministering are we going to be resourceful in the Holy Ghost I mean like I said there's many takes that you can have on this but we want to take the time to establish something right now God is still going to be God God is always going to have a way to administer those people healings are going to take place financial blessing, everything. God is not limited in all these things. So let's take the time and we're going to, and I'm going to read this scripture and then we're going to tie it together. And it's going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And this is Paul when, when, he, when he's making, when he's making an argument with the Corinthian church in, in, in some of their perceptions on things. Let's tie this together. Starting in verse number one says, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are ye not are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. My answer to them that do examine me is this. So, so you see he's having to prove himself. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister? a wife, as well as other apostles, as, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas. Or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working. We're talking about some stuff here. Now watch this. Who go for warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eat of not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eat of not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of, the, of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth, doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Now watch this. If others be partaker of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Watch this. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? Now this is an Old Testament scripture and, and, and Paul is making reference, reference to this in the New Testament. There's a reason why I'm going there. And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so have the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. That's powerful. Now watch this. It says, but I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. And that's important. For it would be better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in void. Now Paul is saying this not as a form of making people do stuff. Hallelujah. But the idea is he's giving them an illustration. And I'm going to tie this together to some perception that, that goes on and things, some things that have been said. 
He's making this in reference to how things are supposed to be. And for those of you that listen to our videos, and those of you that have ministerial aspirations, that's ultimately, you want to get an understanding of these things. Those that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Now, there's other things that you can do in addition to that. Now, we understand that Paul made tents, but he did those as a way of making sure that he was going to be able to preach the gospel. All right, so I said all that to say this. Now, let's go back to something to what I want to say right here in verse 13. It says, do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers, hallelujah, with, with, with the altar. Now, he's, give, he's giving the illustration from verses 9 up, and, he, and, and he's basically telling you, in the New Testament, Basically, how things are supposed to be within the realm of ministerial protocol. Now, I took the time to carefully dissect this scripture for this reason. In Ephesians chapter 4, and you read verses, verses 11, we'll, we'll probably go there if opportunity presents itself. It gives you a listing of the ministries. And what happens is that in this particular time, we need to break down, I mean, we need to break down what the true storehouse is. Because there's lots of people that have erroneously have said that the storehouse is a building the local church. That's only half true. That's half true. And the reason why I gave an illustration of Paul using an Old Testament scripture, because again, in the Old Testament, under the Old Testament, the storehouse was technically a place. There were specific places uh, in, under the Old Covenant where the Levites and the priests would congregate. And the ones that was primarily mobile was the king, the prophet, and the high priest. But most of the other, but, but most of the other Levites and priests was pretty much delegated to appointed places in the nation of Israel and in Judah. These was designated places where the presence of God was and where people would meet. So under those circumstances, that was considered the storehouse. Now, in the New Testament, I want you to hear me. When Jesus came to facilitate the new covenant, he did preach in the synagogue. He did administer in the synagogue. But you saw the priesthood that Jesus was introducing in, in the New Testament. You saw him going from place to place. Even though we would classify him as a chief apostle and a prophet, he was Lord, he, he went from place to place evangelizing, and the people that he was raising up, he was pastoring 12, but they was moving from place to place. I want you to understand that. So, we have this perception that the local church by itself is the storehouse. That's only half true. And there's other half-truths out there that, that we may expound upon. Let me give you another half-truth. It is, it is true that apostles do establish churches, but by itself, that, that's only half-truth. Apostles, in, in a correct assessment, build ministries. They establish ministries. They, they can establish churches, but they also establish ministries because there's people out there that establish churches that do not carry the DNA of an apostle. The people establish churches that have no power. So just because a person establishes churches, a person establishes does not make them an apostle. So these are, these are things that we have to fix. And the stuff that I'm telling you right now may not be popular with a lot of people, but, but we have to understand that in this dispensation of time, the things that that, that we had been teaching and preaching before all of this social distancing and stuff, like I said, it was easy not to dispute those things. All right. So what I'm saying right now is, is that under the New Testament, under the New Testament, the, when we deal with, with the ministries, the primary ministries, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and teacher, out of those five major ministries, Two of them are relegated to the local church. That's the pastor and the teacher. Even though the evangelist and the prophet and the apostle 
work in conjunction with the local church. They're not confined to the local church. Hear me clearly. They're not confined to the local church. They have to move wherever the Spirit leads them, and they have to, they have to, they're responsible for a jurisdiction. They're, they're responsible to be gifts in the body of Christ. You cannot mean evangelists. We have we have a lot of evangelists that don't evangelize. They they spend time sit, sitting in the house of God on Sunday instead of going out and doing the work of the ministry. Like they can't be saved two or three weeks away from the local church and go out and do what 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 their ministry gifting is supposed to do. Evangelize. That's what evangelists do. Evangelists go out and evangelize. They go out in the street. They preach in churches. They go out different places. They evangelize. That's what a prophet does. A prophet will prophesy not just in the local church. He'll prophesy in the church, yeah. But a prophet is an extension beyond the local church, and they go out. But they're part of the priesthood. Now, when Paul is getting, and the same thing with the apostle, the apostle doesn't minister within the parameters of the four walls, but an apostle has an assignment beyond the four walls. I want you to hear me clearly today. Some of this dumb, stupid, idiotic teaching that is out here. You got to understand something. Paul is giving a reference to the Old Testament scripture and applying him and Barnabas in that category. Does everybody understand that? Now, Paul spent a lot of his time writing scriptures in jail. He was in jail. He was locked up in jail. He was not within the local assembly. Does everybody understand that? So, a lot of this dumb, stupid, idiotic teaching out here puts people in a place where they have everything within the parameters of the four walls. And, and to prove my point, with all of the teaching and all of the preaching that has been done, how much of the local area has been transformed? I want you to hear me. How much of the region that you've been in with all the churches on every corner, how much of it has been transformed with the power and the presence of God? How much of an area has seen the overall scope supernaturally change because the saints are out administering the power and the presence of God? Because everything has been delegated with people coming to a building and not going out into the streets and affecting change. True evangelism is not just in the house of God. True evangelism is a, is a reflection and a manifestation that goes on, goes out into the highways, into the byways, into the supermarket, into the libraries, in, 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 into, the, into, into the world. Because this is the thing. When we as believers go out, we carry the power and the presence of God with us. We are the church. The ecclesia, the church, is an extension of heaven, not just in the local body, but also in the world because we carry the power and the presence of God with us. Yes, we should fellowship together. I'm, I'm going on record, we should fellowship together. But right now, that's being redefined. Does everybody understand that it's being redefined? Because many people, sometimes the best thing to happen is, 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 is for our places of worship for a time and a place and a season to be put in a holding pattern so people can get on their face before God, get fresh revelation, but also take the ministry out where it's supposed to go. Take the ministry of Christ where it's supposed to go. Because the truth of the matter is that with some of your local assemblies, there ain't nothing happening anyway. There ain't, there ain't no power. There is no manifestation. And I have to be real and honest about that. Nobody's getting healed. Nobody's being transformed. I mean, people are not being fed in a lot of places. They're not. And particularly a lot of these seeker-friendly establishments, this happens every week when nobody's getting fed. And then here locally, you got people doing crazy stuff, putting scriptures and stuff together. And preaching on something that don't have anything to do with what the text that they just read. And people are listening to that garbage and mess and saying, preach, pastor, preach. No transformation. Preacher preaching one thing and living something out of the pulpit. The devil is a lie. And we call that the local church. Really? Come on now. Give me a break. Now listen. Now listen. It sounds like I'm fussing, but we have to be honest concerning all of this. We need to walk in the power and the presence of God. I've been saying that. I've been saying this in many events that we need to take the church out of the four walls. And we can do a lot of things 
in personal ministry now that before people did for some for some unexplained reason didn't feel that they that they had the right to do and and, and listen and in a lot of places people are more into control than they are in the order we see that happen here locally a lot of people are not in the liberty of sharing the gospel they're in the bondage and th there's places here locally that that make you feel that if you're not in their presence that you're not in the presence of God. There's lots of people feel that when you leave their church, that you done left God. My wife and I have experienced that. We've experienced it. God wants to set his people free because when we when we idolize men and women more than we idolize God, we've got the we've got the wrong situation here. And lots of people right now, this is an opportunity for you to get on your face before the Lord and seek him for, for true revelation. Now, there's lots of people that have been tied up into these seeker-friendly situations that are sincere, but they just, they just needed a wake-up call. This is your wake-up call. This is a time for you to get before God and learn Him for who He is. Let God realign you with where He wants to align you. Let Him cover you with who He wants to cover you with. Let Him yoke you up with who He wants to yoke you up with in this season. Because during this season, you're starting to see the real and the false. During this season, you're starting to see a shaking. Hallelujah. But again, let me, reiter let me reiterate my point. The local church, the local church is part, is part of the storehouse. Not, not it totally. It's not, let's listen. Part of the local, part of, part of the storehouse is the apostle. Part of the storehouse is the prophet. Part of the storehouse is the evangelist. And they have to be moving around. They cannot be confined to a specific location. The devil has, has deceived us in thinking that, that it is one way. And, and, and you know, this is the thing. What the devil has done with that is tried to cut off the supply to the apostle, the prophet, and the evangelist in a lot of circles. Because in a, in a lot of circles... We magnify the ministry of the pastor more than we magnify all five of the ministries. People will say that everybody should have a pastor. That is true. Everybody should. But it is true that they, everyone should have, have somebody that can teach them. It's also true that somebody should have an evangelist. It's also true that somebody should have a prophet. It's also true that, some, that some, everybody should have an apostle. It's true that we all should have to have all five of the ministry gifts. And, not just the pastor. We need all five of the ministry gifts in order, in order for us to be well-rounded according to Ephesians chapter 4. We need all of these to be well-rounded to come into the knowledge of the Son of God. Not just one more than the other. The devil is a lie. So I had to throw that in there for good measure. Because again, there's lots of, there's lots of people that are immature in the things of God because they do not have access to I mean, not because it's not available, but they don't have access because they don't take the time to reach out and understand what the Word of God says concerning that. The storehouse is bigger than a building. There's people that feed you beyond the building. And, and perception is, is this. So they, people will say that you go where you're being fed. The, I can point to you a lot of people that are sitting in a church every Sunday and are not being fed. They're not being fed. But they're being fed by the evangelist. They're being fed by the prophet. They're being fed by the apostle. Really, seriously. Th these are the type of scenarios that take place in the body of Christ. And, and I'm not talking heresy. I'm telling you, I'm being real with you. I, this is what I see. Hallelujah. We have pastors that don't walk in the power and the presence of God. But they put people in bondage. And they're afraid that somebody's going to come in and take their members, which ain't their members anyway. Hallelujah. Because none of us died for anybody. We, God is bringing an aligning and, and, and a restructuring of his church. I feel this strongly right now. And I'm not advocating anarchy. I'm advocating order. I'm advocating divine order. Not the order of men, but divine order. And again, what I've said before, and I'm going to say this again. If a person is not walking in the power and the presence of God, walking in the revelation and the leading of the Holy Ghost, they cannot cover you. They cannot cover you at all. 
Because they don't have no direction from God. So if they don't have any direction from God, how can they direct you? Really? I want you to think about this. Hallelujah. Because men and women of God that are walking in the things of God have to fight demonic activity all the time. And they're walking in the power and the presence of God. How much more are you? is it open season on your life if you're under somebody who's not walking in the power and the presence of God? It is open season on your life because you're not covered. That's just the bottom line. Hallelujah. And while we're trying to confine people to locations and buildings, God is, is interested in something beyond your local assembly. God is interested in bringing his body of believers together. In the United States, in other countries of the world, God is interested in bringing his church, his ecclesia, his remnant together so we can come together and prepare for his return, the Lord Jesus' return. That's what, that's what God is about. While people are trying to establish their own kingdoms, God is more interested in his kingdom. Does everybody understand that? God is ready to establish his kingdom. Hallelujah. And if the local church is a part of the kingdom of God, so be it. I, I go on record in saying that. But many times, people want to establish their kingdom more than the kingdom of God. The devil is a lie. And you can see the fruit of that. Because people say, well, I got to go to my church. I got to go to my church. I got to go to my church. Your church is bigger than your local assembly. There's brothers and sisters in Christ that you don't know. They're part of you. They're part of, of, of they're, they're part of this. Hallelujah. And part of my job as a prophet and an apostle is to get people on illumination that the work of the Lord is bigger than you and I. The work of the Lord is bigger than me. The work of the Lord is bigger than you. The work of the Lord is bigger than anybody who, 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 think, who thinks too highly of themselves. We have, we have to administer to everybody. It doesn't matter what church that people belong to. We, we administer to everybody that comes to us. I want you to hear me clearly. That's how that is. You don't have, you don't have to be part of, my, I mean, part of the local assembly for me to minister to you. Matter of fact, we minister to people all the time. And this is the thing. When I go out in the street, I don't have a receipt book. In other words, when I go up there and prophesy to people, I don't have a receipt book. Okay, that's $50 for this prophecy. The devil is a lie. I don't do that. The devil is a lie. We prophesy as God gives us the word. And then from that point on, it is what it is. You know, we trust the Lord concerning everything. We don't, we don't, we don't put people in bondage with a Bible. Hallelujah. It's God's responsibility. Hear me clearly. It's God's responsibility to be able to take care of his ministers. This is, this is rule of thumb. I want you to hear me clearly. When a person is called of God to do what God's called him to do, then it's God's responsibility to take care of them. However God does it. And, and the other thing is, is that when you, are, when you are blessed with resources, make sure that you're sowing what God has given you into good ground. Now, God told me back in 2018, I believe it was, to start taking 30% of what he blesses me with and set it aside. That includes tithes, that includes offerings, 30%. So anybody that has a dispute with the tithe offering, God just, just eliminated that, that for me, 30%. <laughs> just take it off the top. And at first, it was a challenge to want to do that. But I've seen the fruit of it. God supernaturally blesses. Now that may that may bless somebody, but 30%. So that means every time Apostle Young receives something, it's a sacrifice. 30% is a sacrifice. So every time I receive something, it is a sacrifice. And God has proven himself. God has never left me hanging by walking in his obedience. Remember, obedience is supernatural. The rule of thumb is do what God tells you to do. And that includes giving what God commands of you and where. We don't sow in the seeker-friendly stuff. We don't do that anymore. Because seeker-friendly stuff is an offense to God. It's a slap in God's face. They do not operate in the Holy Ghost. And you can't sow into something where somebody's not operating the Holy Ghost and get Holy Ghost results. That's just the way it is. You have to understand 
that in this dispensation time, if anybody is going to survive as a, as a believer and as a ministry, they're going to have to walk in the power and the presence of God. They're going to have to walk in the things of the supernatural. It is what it is. You need to understand that. Hallelujah. But again, my point is this, is that the local church is part, is part of the storehouse. Not, not, not totally, I mean, it's, it's, it's not the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, teacher, ministries of help, they, 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 they all work together, but this is the bottom line. You can't confine the move of God to a building. You cannot confine the move of God to a location. Particularly not the New Testament church. You cannot confine the move of God. You cannot confine the priesthood to the local building. Hallelujah. I'm finished. This is Apostle Young with your word to today. Walk in the obedience of the Holy Ghost. Use this time wisely to hear what thus saith the Lord. Let the Lord lead you to where he wants you to, to be. Let the Lord lead you where he wants you to sow seed. That's the bottom line. I'm not talking about anarchy. I'm talking about divine order. Because only when you walk in obedience to the Holy Ghost, you're going to walk in the full revelation of, of what your purpose and destiny is. We'll be talking to you again real soon in the not-too-distant future.